the first couple of seconds after an engine failure in a light twin decide how the rest of the story goes. Get ahead of it and it's just another day. Fall behind and things can get ugly fast. You've probably seen that clip floating around social media. A light twin rotates, climbs a few feet, one engine coughs, the airplane snaps toward the dead side, and it's all over in seconds. I don't want to move faster than the investigators, but the profile looks like the classic VMC role we're all taught to fear. To understand why that happens, you've got to look at the basic geometry of almost every legacy twin. For decades, light twins have all followed the same recipe. Stick an engine on each wing, well outboard, give the pilot redundancy, and call it a day. Barons, Senecas, 310s, you name it, the engines are sitting way out on the wings. And when both engines are pulling together, everything is happy. But the moment one quits, all that outboard thrust becomes a liability. The good engine is now producing all the thrust through a big lever arm, way off the center line. That yaw toward the dead engine comes instantly, and if you don't catch it, yaw turns into roll, fast. The farther out the engines are, the stronger that roll couple becomes. And that's the real reason twins bite people. Designers have known about this engine out problem forever, and a few of them actually tried to engineer their way out of it by changing the whole layout. One of the early fixes was centerline thrust. Instead of hanging engines way out on the wings, you put one in the nose and one in the tail, so the thrust always stays on the center line, meaning you have no critical engine or VMC dramas. The Cessna Skymaster is the poster child for this. But that layout brought its own headaches. The rear prop sits right behind the cabin, so you get noise and vibration. And because the sound profile barely changes when the rear engine quits, the early 337s had a number of accidents where pilots didn't notice the failure at all. Cessna even tried a rear engine thrust warning light early on, but it proved unreliable and was eventually dropped. But even with the warning system, the rear engine still ate up baggage space, and the airflow back there was messy, which meant efficiency was never great. Then you had the experimenters, people like Bert Rutan who went full mad scientist on the problem. He tried twins like the Defiant and the Boomerang, reshaping the airframe so the airplane behaved itself even with one engine out. And honestly, he proved you can design your way out of the worst asymmetric traps if you're willing to rethink the whole airplane. But this design never quite caught up. The market stayed boring. Everyone kept buying conventional wing-mounted twins. Most designers either stuck with the old layout and accepted its quirks, or tried to fix the problem by reinventing the whole airplane. Diamond took a third path. Instead of moving engines around or coming up with exotic configurations, they kept the classic twin layout, but then quietly engineered away the vulnerabilities that make legacy twins so unforgiving. And to understand how they did that, you have to look at the exact part of the takeoff where light twins are most vulnerable. So what decides whether a failure on takeoff is a non-event or a fatal roll is the gap between rotation speed VR best single engine climb speed VYSE or the blue line, and how close the airplane is to VMC minimum control speed while you're trapped in that gap. Every twin is defined by these three speeds, VMC, VR, and VYSE. So what matters for survival is where VR sits compared to VMC and how far below VYSE you are after liftoff, because that determines how long you're forced to live in the slow, low, asymmetric part of the envelope. And the reason is that below minimum control speed, the airplane just doesn't have the rudder to hold straight with full asymmetric thrust. You can muscle it a bit by reducing power, but you can't guarantee control. At the blue line, clean and trimmed, you're getting the best single engine climb the airplane will ever give you. Everything between those two speeds is the danger band. You can stay in control there, but you're slow, you're dirty, you're dragging half the airframe, and the airplane can't climb the way the book says it will. But if rotation speed is well above the minimum control speed and close to the blue line, you blast through that band before anything has time to get exciting. But if rotation speed sits right on top of the minimum control speed and a long way below the blue line, you end up hanging around in that band long enough for things to go sideways. Take a DA-62 or DA-42. Typical real-world numbers put rotation speed in the high 70s, blue line in the high 80s, 
and the minimum control speed just a handful of knots below rotation. That means you rotate only slightly above VMC and you're less than 10 knots below blue line as the wheels leave the ground. From the seat, it's almost anticlimactic. You rotate, pitch settles, gear comes up, and by the time you glance back inside, you're basically at the blue line. You don't hang around in the danger band. You're through it almost instantly. Now imagine losing an engine at liftoff. You're already above VMC. If your foot moves the right way and you don't yank the nose up, the airplane stays controllable and the airspeed keeps building. Blue line is moments away. And once the dead prop is feathered and the airplane is cleaned up, the single engine climb is exactly what the POH promised. In other words, in a DA-62, you're almost out of the danger zone before the gear is halfway up. It can still bite you if you pitch too high and drift back toward VMC, but the airplane is trying to help you. Small rotation to blue line gap, low absolute speeds, and strong one engine and operative performance once you're at blue line. That's what people mean when they call them kind twins. You simply don't spend much time in that VMC-ish far below VYSE no man's land. Now put that next to a classic high-performance light twin. A Baron 58, for example, usually has minimum control speed in the mid-80s and blue line just north of 100. Most Barons rotate in the mid-80s, basically right on top of the minimum control speed. At liftoff, you are only a couple of knots above the red line and still 15 plus knots below the blue line. On a heavy day, the sequence is always the same. Rotate at 85, 87, climb away just barely above the minimum control speed, the gear starts up, airspeed is still low, and acceleration isn't instant. If an engine quits here and you let the nose drift even a little high before pushing it back down, the speed runs straight toward VMC again while you're still low, still dirty, and still asymmetric. Same pilot as in the DA-62, totally different geometry. In the Diamond, you lift off near the top of the danger band. In the Baron, you leave near the bottom. So, when pilots say, this airplane will flip over and bite you if you lose an engine, what they're really describing is the geometry. The airplane forces you to spend several seconds deep inside the gap between VMC and VYSE with almost no margin for hesitation. The 310R raises the stakes even more. Published numbers put the clean stall in the high 70s, minimum control speed around 80, and best single engine climb speed about 106. Lots of 310 pilots rotate in the mid 80s. That means that at liftoff, you are only a breath above both stall and the minimum control speed and more than 20 knots below the best single-engine climb speed, VYSE. Lose an engine here and mishandle the pitch just slightly, and the rest is predictable. You raise the nose for a climb you'll never get, the speed stagnates because the single engine is fighting drag and configuration, a few knots disappear, and suddenly you're sitting right on that VMC stall cluster. Yaw grows. The dead wing reaches its critical angle first, you instinctively add aileron, which adds more drag, and the airplane does exactly what the red line warned you about. It rolls toward the dead engine. There's no mystery. This is what happens when a takeoff is flown wrapped around VMC with blue line sitting way out of reach, unless you accept losing altitude to accelerate. Let's look at more extremes. Look at a Cessna 340 or a pressurized Baron 58P. In a 340, depending on the model, VMC lives in the low 80s to low 90s and VYSE around 100. Some operators brief rotate at VMC plus 5, climb at VYSE plus 5. The result is that liftoff often happens just above VMC and a good 10 knots below blue line. Add weight, heat, and high power, and the single engine climb is workable, but not amazing. Lose an engine and your survival depends on hitting the exact nose attitude that protects speed while still letting the airplane accelerate. Hold a proud two-engine climb attitude and you'll sit in the gap forever. The airplane will never accelerate to blue line and the yaw angle of attack stall combo will come for you. A 58P pushes that logic even deeper. Rotation in the mid-80s, VYSE around a 115, nearly a 30-knot gap between rotation and blue line, 300 horsepower on each wing, and heavy wing loading. On a hot, heavy day, you might be in the low 90s after liftoff, still 20 knots below VYSE, and an engine-out acceleration in that regime is anything but brisk. This is where razor-sharp is not a cliché, but a literal description. 
In a 58P, the safe box is tiny. Correct rudder immediately, nose set precisely, and a commitment to let the airplane accelerate. Step outside that box, and the gap will eat you. That's why the same failure in two different twins can look like two different stories. One a non-event, the other a fatal roll. The physics didn't change. The gap did. The Seminole also exemplify forgiving gaps. At typical training weights, the Seminole's minimum control speed lives in the mid-50s, best single-engine climb speed in the high 80s, but rotation happens in the mid-70s. You're 20 knots above the minimum control speed as you fly off, and only 10 or 15 knots shy of blue line 20 knots. But what makes the DA-62 remarkable is that it gives you this same trainerish kindness in a high-performance airframe. It behaves like a Seminole when the chips are down. Yet once you're cleaned up, you get a high-performance airplane. It's the strange, very rare mix of a forgiving trainer during the worst second of the flight and a serious cross-country machine once you're past it, giving you the best of both worlds. So that's it for today's video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. It goes a long way for us.